Good afternoon and welcome to today's Top Tips webinar. My name is James Evely and I'm the editor of In Publishing. These are strange and unsettling times with business models and patterns of working thrown upside down. I'm trying to avoid using the word unprecedented because my kids have started keeping a tally of the number of times I say it. But that is exactly what it is. Today's webinar will look at one significant aspect of the coronavirus crisis, namely working from home. The format of the webinar is very straightforward. Russell will make a 20 minute presentation, which will be followed by a 10 minute Q&A. To take part in the Q&A, simply type your question into the panel in front of you at any time. I will then collate the questions and put as many of them as possible to Russell after his presentation. I won't read out the names of the people asking the questions, just the questions themselves. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you straight over to Russell. Hello, and thank you for joining. Um, welcome everyone. So yes, as James said, we're gonna talk a bit about the subject of uh, working from home and in the current circumstances, how best to um, make these uh, processes work. So uh, just a little bit of background. Um, we're gonna cover some of the key topics. Um, so adapting your home, how you deal with family um, in the house, not used to working together all the time, how to deal with communication at work um, when you're working remotely, and with a particular emphasis, obviously, on the magazine um, production and content creation process, how to track work in progress, looking at tools and technologies you can use to aid in those things, and uh, maintaining effective remote collaboration. And then how a little bit about maybe how to um, support your staff in the process as well, given the amount of uh, change that they're going through at the moment. So a little bit of uh, background and context about us and why we're doing this. Um, Evolve Media is a company that's been around for about 13 years now. We've got a wide range of clients across the media industry, um, not just publishing, but um, media companies, broadcasters, music producers. Um, so we deal with a, quite a wide range of companies that are both local and international. We've actually been running as a virtual office for about five years. So a lot of the changes that people are making now very rapidly, we've had the time to do over a number of years, find the pitfalls, uh, make mistakes, and try and work out good processes and good ways of working for our teams. Also, our teams are actually quite um, disparate in terms of location. So while a number of us are based in and around London, uh, there's a couple of us also based in Turkey, um, in Istanbul, who do development work, and at least one of those actually spends about a quarter to a third of his year being a digital nomad, traveling around and doing his work. So, um, yeah, we've had to develop a lot of processes around how to work remotely, how to manage a team that are very rarely ever in one place. Um, we are a partner for editorial tools for the Woodwing products. Um, so we are a partner and system integrator. Those tools are often used by a lot of our customers for these kinds of uh, remote collaborations. Um, so that's also part of what we do. Um, we have a sister company who's kind of a mirror image of us based in the Netherlands. So we also work with those with remote working tools and processes as well and share projects across the two companies. And uh, as you can see, there's a kind of wide range of customers there that um, we work with. So yeah, why, why did we go virtual? Um, so the background is that yeah, most of the time we used to have an office. So for six or seven years, we had an office. Um, we found that customers rarely came to us. Most of the time we went to customers for meetings and uh, sometimes had our staff based at customers for projects and implementations. Um, yeah, staff were largely moving around, rarely in the office. So there was only ever a few people in the office. Our customers were also becoming more and more uh, geographically diverse. So some of our customers, we are operating with teams that are not based in this country, um, maybe on the east and west coast of the US. Some of our customers have got their own teams that are very dispersed across Europe, um, Asia, and the US as well. So we were increasingly working in an environment where not only us, but our customers were also um, working remotely. So in the end, it made sense to actually get rid of the office because we were paying for something that we didn't need and to actually start working as a, a virtual setup. Um, so yeah, about five years ago, we took the decision to stop using the office. That obviously has a, a, a benefit in terms of saving us in cost, 
Um, and also it actually meant that um, whereas we were trying to have an office to accommodate like having a few people or many people, actually we could be more flexible with things like hiring meeting rooms for the number of people we wanted whenever we wanted. So uh, yeah, we had challenges. Um, it wasn't always an easy ride to start with and I'm sure some of you guys are finding now um, with the changes that you're putting in place that there are ups and downs with these processes and there's a pretty rapid learning curve because work has to go on and projects still have to be completed and magazines still have to go to press. Um, communication is, uh, we found the biggest challenge. Uh, so keeping the teams in touch with each other, um, making sure that people still communicate with each other in the way that they need to, getting t teams and people to adapt to these processes where they're used to being in an office or at a client or you know over the other side of a desk to talk to someone. And also in our case, because we've been doing this for a while where a lot of our customers didn't do this, actually getting customers to believe that as a company, we do actually exist. Um, you know, we have to respond to customers and make quotes and respond to um, project requests. And they kind of go, where's your base? And we go, well, we haven't got one. So yeah, that's, that's an adaption that we had to um, think about and overcome and find a way to put across to our customers, obviously, you know, that's all changed at the moment. Uh, a lot of customers understand exactly where we're coming from now. And then around that, in our case at the time, finding the right um, tools and facilities to both work with electronically, but also to have as places we could go and meet. Obviously, the current problems uh, prohibit us from going out and using those facilities, but uh, for the last few years, we have used a lot of things like Regis, various. Um, office service companies where you can rent rooms by the hour, et cetera. So that was part of it, but uh, not as applicable today. So let's talk first about um, working from home, setting up your home, um, just a few pictures of kind of our reality at the moment, because like yourselves, um, even though we have been doing this for five years, things have changed for us uh, quite a bit. Uh, this is my hub. So I'm very lucky when we did this, we had an old garage that was uh, used as a bit of a dumping ground. We actually converted the garage into an office, clearly not something you guys can rapidly do in the time you need to do now. But if you do have anything where you can kind of break out and reuse space, that's always useful. So yeah, I've got a, a well um, practice set up as you can see now. Uh, again, not everyone's gonna have that right now. But around that, um, we have a daughter as well. She's back from uni because that's now been closed. So she's having to do her final year dissertation, etc. So she's crammed into one room doing all of that as well. Um, uh, wife, also office manager for Evolve Media, uh, which is obviously the, clearly the real hub of the business. Um, she's also working from home. So that part of the business is being run from home as well. And my son who's at college, he's back at home because the college is closed and uh, doing some work around engineering and 3D printing. And we currently have a setup, um, apart from the dog obviously and his uh, mate do kennel, we are 3D printing masks for healthcare workers, etc. at the moment. So we basically set up in the front room, um, a factory to print things. So there's quite a lot going on um, in our house. And obviously we are having to adapt around that. It's very busy. I'm sure it's the same for you guys um, and for your teams that are all working from home that you know, not everyone has the benefit of the space we do. Um, people are having to work from flats and apartments, maybe with kids in the house as well, pets, et cetera, a lot of background noise. Also not used to the fact that neighbors as well are around all the time that maybe would normally be out of office. So there's a lot going on around you. So a few things that um, we found around trying to adapt and even more so now is establishing some, I suppose the word I use is etiquette around the house. How do people do things? Um, some of my team are not used to having all of their partners at home as well working um, for their companies still 
at the same time. So they all do things like conference calls, uh, WebExes, and obviously Zooms and things like that. How do you manage to do all of these things together in a house where often you're sharing space? So we try and establish some etiquette in the sense of who does what when? Can meetings be staggered so you're not all on conference calls at the same time? Uh, can you time things that, so that one of you can take over a room while you're on a call, while the others can move to somewhere else so that there's not a lot of background noise? I found sometimes talking with the team when people are all together that, yeah, if you've got their partner sitting next to them on a call, it sounds like you're on their call with them as well as your call. So, yeah, getting etiquette right for these sorts of things is quite important. Um, you get a lot of background noise. Uh, you know, people working in kitchens and living rooms and you get cookers and washing machines and all those things going. Try and work out ways where, yeah, you can set times for some of these things to go on. I know it's more difficult now because there's more people in the house, but the more you can uh, plan these things out, the better um, you can do the things you've got to do and, you know, achieve the meetings without too much interruption. We have found also with some of our clients um, where they're you know, changing and adapting that they're starting to stagger work hours. So I know that a couple of my clients, I'm speaking to them quite late in the evening because they've got quite young kids in the house and they take turns in looking after them. So while one partner's maybe doing work in the day and the other's doing a bit more looking after the kids, the other's working later at night and they swap over looking after the kids that way. I'm quite comfortable and not going anywhere the same as you guys. So it doesn't bother me if I'm doing calls later in the evening to work with them. So things like that can help. Um, it is very hard for everyone to do everything at the same time. In terms of, um, yeah, new, those new realities. Um, yeah, see how, if there's ways to spread out, if you have got um, bedrooms, other rooms, living rooms, etc., can people spread out? One of the key things in terms of using these kinds of tools and being on conference calls or even being on phone calls is when you're not speaking, try and remember to mute. That cuts out the risk of all the background noise getting in the way and often helps because that background noise, even if um, it's been disturbing other people, often when you're using earphones and things like that actually feeds back into your own earphones so you can't hear the calls properly. So just by putting mute on, you get a clearer reception, not just blocking your noise going to other people. As I said, try and stagger calls. And one of the things I would say, everyone's been going on about things like Zoom and using that at the moment is, um, if you don't do video, it's actually easier for you to move around to do your calls. A lot of people are doing video, which means they're restricted to the places in the house they can do it, sometimes because of their Wi-Fi reception. If you just do audio, um, then you can move to other rooms. You can either take the choice to do calls while you're on your daily um, walk or walking the dog, etc. Again, if you're using mute, it doesn't get in the way. So you can establish flexibility um, around the, the way you do things with your calls. Um, yeah, kids and pets, there's, they're unavoidable. I've met a lot of my customers' kids and pets over the last two weeks. Um, and obviously they've met some of ours. Um, yeah, it's just part of life at the moment. I think everyone is accepting of that reality. And yeah, um, in some ways it's a nice change for us. We see a bit more of our customers uh, real life, not just their office life. But uh, yeah, it's a fact of life at the moment. And I think you have to be flexible that you're gonna get some of this interference when you're doing, doing your work and doing calls, et cetera. If you've got young kids, there's always the, the radical option. Yeah, if they won't shut up, um, yeah, you can uh, make arrangements. But yeah, joking aside, um, normally, uh, yeah, we, we've had kids joining calls, um, has in, introduced the note of entertainment into the process. So talking about um, communication itself, um, yeah, there's a number of things that we found in the process of making these changes. Obviously not everyone is com comfortable with this. A lot of people have worked in offices for years. They're quite used to the idea of being able to talk and get on with their work um, at their desks. Suddenly they're thrust into a world of trying to use tools like Zoom and WebEx and GoToMeeting and things like that. And 
actually they're not necessarily that comfortable with it so you've got to be aware of that with your teams and actually try and nurture that change and encourage them on um recognizing that actually yeah some of those people are not going to be very forthcoming in the new mediums um you're going to need to actually engage with them in terms of you know making sure that their voice is heard in the process um, but I, what I would also say is actually establish some etiquette around this process in the sense of making sure that people understand what is formal and informal communication. So you will have meetings, obviously, like you do in an office that are more formalized. People don't always recognize that when you're doing calls online that, yeah, you can still be having the more informal type of one-to-one -one meeting or one-to-one -one chat. And that, that's, that's OK. They don't have to assume that everything is formal. You kind of still need that water cooler environment. So you need to kind of establish the fact that people can talk to each other, encourage them to talk to each other, maybe one to one over the tools, um, whatever it is that you use. And the fact that you need to fill the void where conversations would normally go on in an office that you kind of, you know, it's the natural thing that goes on. People walk past each other, have a chat. Did you remember to do this? Did you remember that? Oh, what about this? This is a good idea. When people are separated like they are now, a lot of those kinds of conversations don't happen naturally. So you've got to make an effort to encourage people to use the tools to do that a bit more. As I say, fine with the people that are generally comfortable with technology, but you need to make sure that you're encouraging the people that say are, are less comfortable with it to do those kinds of things and to chat. As an example, when we made these changes, we had guys that um, thought that we used Skype a lot, thought that the way to use Skype was you come on into Skype, you launch your app, you do your your chat, and when you're done, you quit. And, and effectively, you're out of communication until the next meeting. Actually, what we kind of do is make sure that people understand that those tools like Skype or Teams or something like that are open all the time. There is an etiquette around the way you communicate with people. So you can't just expect to kind of put some text into chat to someone and that they have to drop everything and respond to you immediately. But the door is open, the, the, the chat is there. So you can effectively walk up to someone and chat and tap them on the shoulder and say, when you're free, have you got a moment? Without them leaving those apps open, it's actually hard to know, yeah, when can I talk to you? When can't I talk to you? So actually that water cooler type thing is the fact that, yeah, whatever apps you use to do these kinds of things, stay in communication need to be there so that they're effectively your mechanism to always be able to engage across the team. Um, a few things around that as well. Yeah, and a bit like people talk about in the office, don't have unnecessary meetings. Keep meetings that are online short focused brief catch-ups do we have any problems we'll talk about more about that um a bit later but it's we have um scrums three times a week monday wednesday and friday friday is more detailed project catch-ups monday wednesday is yeah everyone's on it do i have a problem do i have something that's blocking what i need to get done today if no move on we get those meetings done in about 15 to 20 minutes um, and that's the etiquette that we have around them. So everyone's encouraged to be brief and succinct, but know that they can put something out there if they need help. Talking a little bit more about um, production, because obviously this is, you know, a lot of what the audience is um, involved in. Yeah, we know that even though we specialize in selling workflow and productivity tools for production, there are still a lot of people out there that are using file servers. Um, a lot of their processes were built around the fact that most of them were in an office doing production. Maybe a few of them were occasionally out once a week working from home, but largely the processes and procedures that you have are built around the fact that you're all in one place. You're still often using file servers and um, shared folders and things like that to produce pages and magazines. So when people aren't together, actually these processes are now a lot harder to manage. Um, understanding who's got files open, who's working on them. You can't just, as I say, you know, shout across the desk, where are we with this, etc. cetera. Um, so you need a bit more support in terms of tools around that. 
And there are a number of um, different levels of tools that you can look at, not just the tools that we um, sell, but um, things that start you off at a lower level, but will help facilitate collaboration and communication. So there's a few examples. Some of you may have these, um, but may have not actually consciously used them in this context. So if you have Office 365 accounts, yeah, you can already do things like have online cloud shared folders and people can collaborate within tools such as Word, etc., to write copy, to comment on it, to, you know, uh, collaborate around it. If you look at things like Dropbox, um, they have things like that as well. A lot of these tools have um, apps that you can install locally that help you cache files locally to keep maintain speed of opening and closing files, do things like lock in a files when you've got them in use so other people can't get them, and even add some metadata around it so people can understand where things are. You can institute um, processes around things like spreadsheets and shared spreadsheets in Office 365 and Google Sheets, so that if you need to do some manual tracking of your production processes, you can do it in an environment everyone can see in real time. There are tailored apps for the production and, and magazine publishing industries, such as things like DeskNet, which allow you to have cloud-based um, commissioning, collaboration around um, organizing your content and working with photographers and things like that. And obviously the things that we specialize in like Woodwings Enterprise products where you've got full production environments that often in the past have been hosted in your own servers but can now be run in the cloud and we do with customers so that actually you've got real time production running across the cloud to all your users. So a little bit more about um, tools, yep, so like Dropbox you can see here, you can actually see it on your desktop on a Mac or PC, you can have a drive that um, looks like one of your local drives on your machine. As you can see here, just by right clicking on the file, I can see things like version history of assets, so I can know who's been editing the file, I can send links out both to my staff or to third party uh, contributors and things like that. I can view files in the browser and actually if you go into the Dropbox apps, there's some quite advanced tools for collaboration around editing files, um, whether it's reading Word files, etc., or spreadsheets or anything like that. And you can do things like SmartSync where um, you can choose out of a folder that you've got shared which files need to be synced to your local machine so that you're not filling up your own drive with a lot of unnecessary content that you're actually never going to work with. There's a good app that um, yeah, gives you a real-time view of activity that's going on. As I've already said, there's version tracking and editing tools. If you look at things like Google Docs, a lot of our customers have used these for parts of their editorial process where they're um, starting to commission articles and don't yet need it in a structured format. So you can do collaborative editing in the browser where multiple people can be in a file at the same time. People can add comments, um, you know, on and offline editing and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and you can see here version history of files there. So who's edited it? You know, you can revert to old versions, that kind of thing. So all the things that you might need that improve upon the basic operation of files and folders that you might have had in the office. In terms of more fully fledged production tools, as I said, you know, we work with tools like Woodwing Enterprise. Here, so you've got browser based tools that give you full interactivity of the status of production of pages and the content on pages. Um, you can collaborate, do markup, corrections, things like that in the browser. And in this case, you can create structured content to go onto your pages in the browser as well. So, as I said earlier on, the range of tools you could be using that might facilitate this new way of working can range from just add-ons to the simple things you already have, such as Office 365 or Dropbox, right up to the level of full um, magazine-focused production tools. Um, yeah, so using tools um, and technology together, um, obviously there's there's two sides to this. So some of the advice and some of the experience we had is, um, yep, 
use a set of tools to stick to it, whether it's Skype or Slack or Teams and Zoom with current favorite, use one tool, get the whole team using that and stick to the processes around that. If you're doing production, use choose your set of tools for that and get the whole team to stick to that. Establish the way you wanna communicate and the etiquette that you need around it and get the team to stick to that. If everyone's working the same way, it becomes a lot easier. Um, don't let people go off using all different tools because that's their current favorite. As I mentioned earlier, do things like uh, scrums, etc. This is something that came out of our development team, but is we use more broadly across the company. Keep those calls focused. Don't let people distract off of it and just turn into general chit chats. Keep them short, focused. Only invite people to the meetings that strictly need to be there, so people don't spend a lot of time sitting around listening to conference calls that they don't need to. I would suggest don't need, use video unless you really have to. Some people are using it more because because they're stuck at home. They, you know, that gives them that feeling of a bit of social interaction, but it sucks up your bandwidth um, and can be a distraction as well. And as I said earlier, if you're just doing audio, it allows you more flexibility about moving around and, and you know, doing being in different places when you're doing the call. As I say again, use your mute button copiously. Um, and notice that actually most of your kids, if you have younger kids that do gaming and things like that, they do all of this stuff already. They're probably more expert at you. And although that it does sound chaotic and sometimes probably a bit fruity if you're like ours and teenagers, um, they have their rules and their etiquette for doing it as well. They establish them and they stick to them. And if they don't, they generally kick their friends off if they're not doing it. Recognize that this is a process that will continue to uh, change and adapt over time. So regularly look at what's working and what isn't working for you and don't be scared to change it after say a couple of weeks if it's not the right way for you. And one thing I'd say is make a conscious effort with these tools to engage with the team or have people in your team that are good at engaging with the rest of the team. I'm not always the one that has the time to do this, but I know there's one or two people in my team that across the span of a day will always be speaking to everyone in the team so that we know that they are okay, that they're there, um, yeah, and they're able to do their job. In terms of supporting your staff, regularly check in with the individuals, especially those that are not that comfortable using the tools. Watch for people that are dropping off the radar a bit, particularly obviously now we're worrying about people being ill. Um, it's easy, particularly if you've got big teams, to forget those that are quieter. So just make sure you are checking in with them and let them know that this is what you're doing on them so that they don't feel that, you know, this is you just checking up on them and whether they're doing their work. It's generally, you know, are people okay? Um, they won't always say if they're not feeling good, you know. And if they don't respond, follow up. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a thing the staff know if we haven't heard from them in the morning, we will check in and we will call them and we will use other me methods to just make sure they're okay because you know we have a duty of care to make sure that while they're working at home, um, they are still being looked after. So, yeah, um, those are the main points. Um, I know it's time is already running out, um, so I'm not, I suppose, any questions at this point. Okay, um, Russell, hi. Yeah, there are a few. Um, so, um, how do you manage underperformance in your team as a manager when wor working remotely? Uh, yes, a very hard one. Obviously, um, you can't have face-to-face -face meetings. Um, obviously, you can have one-to-one -one Zooms. They can be um, a bit awkward. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a very difficult situation now in terms of where it is. You know, People could have all sorts of reasons um, for underperforming, obviously genuine health issues, uh, the fact that they're not comfortable with this new way of working. Um, so I tend to say it's a softly, softly approach at the moment. You know, as I say, it's to checking in with people, checking they're OK, trying to spot early if things are going wrong. If they're not, people aren't comfortable with this and these tools and these ways of working, um, it's talking about it. And, and as I say, that's defining the practices and ways to adapt that suit your team. Okay. Um, if working in collaboration with my team 
if one member goes sick, how easy is it to retask their work to another member and which tools are best at that? Um, certainly, I think this angle of using things like cloud services in terms of things like Office 365, uh, Dropbox, they do make that easier because there is that collaboration element built within them. So there is an element of being able to kind of see who had a file, who was working on the file. They're not, say, as fully functional in terms of tools like we use, like um, Enterprise, where you can physically assign um, work, you know, and, and files that people are working on to people. Um, but there is a bit of checking in and checking out and things like that in those services. So they they help with those processes and they are definitely much better than just trying to work on a file server. But as I said, they scale up depending on the level you go for. I think Office 365, Google Docs do the basics, full production tools, um, you know, do do more. You know, you, you can assign and see, everyone can see who, who has got things assigned to them. So it's easier if they're not available and if they are sick to pull things back and reassign them to other people. Would you say that setting yourself and your team a strict routine is a good idea? Um, I would say the routines in terms of what I talked about in terms of etiquette. So, you know, it is expected. We have a scrum on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And in our case, the size of our team, which is on average eight to 10 people, um, they are expected to attend that. You know, they, good reasons, obviously, if they're sick, yeah, that's a reason not to attend it. But other than that, they are expected to attend it. They work their diaries around it. That is the way we stay linked together. And it is very much, we go through every person and we go, do you have a blocking issue? Do you have something that you need help with today? They are kind of now trained because we've been doing it for a few years where they literally come in and go, nothing for me today. Right, fine, move on to the next person. Yes, I've got something. OK, short conversation. Does this need to be arranged as another call? OK, take it out of this call. Move on to the next person. That, that's the kind of thing. But outside that, people's hours and times have to adapt around the situation that we're in now. So you, you can't be overly rigid on that point. OK, Russell, great. Do, do you encourage social gatherings? Um... Uh, sorry, do you encourage social gatherings like the ones the staff might ordinarily engage in at a normal workplace? Like, hey, have you got time to go for a beer? Do you recommend virtual social hours? Um, so before this situation, yes, we we um, we didn't do it enough. And we did find actually that we, we once went to a meeting with a customer and one of my team walked in and um, this, one of the customers actually said, when was the last time you two got together? And we went, Ooh. I think it was about four months ago. Um, so, you know, and that was just happened to be one person because we've been doing different things on different projects. But um, yeah, so in that case, we made a more conscious effort in to have physical gatherings um, and try and do it and have social things that got us together in London, et cetera, and do things occasionally where the guys flew over from Turkey. And um, if it coincided with the right sort of project stuff, we'd have a proper team gathering. Obviously now, that's out the window. Um, but do we do them socially? I mean, some of our guys are developers. They probably they'll do it through gaming or something like that. Um, they'll some of them find their own routes for that in the team. Okay, great. What what is the best way that you have found to stop people talking over each other? Uh, yeah, that that's a hard one. Um, it's quite funny watching some of the customers on calls and even some of my family where we've done quiz nights over the last few weeks and things like that, where the first time they use it, there's 20 people talking together. Um, that is the etiquette. That is why I say use mute. It makes people think about when they are and aren't speaking because they're trained into, it's a bit like the old radio thing over and out, you know, you click off mute when you've got something to say. Other than that, you're on mute because any noise, you clicking your keyboard, moving stuff around your desk, even moving your microphone around on your headset or anything like that will feed back into the whole group. But it's a discipline that makes people think about when do I need to say something and giving other people room to say their bit as well. 
Excellent. Um, is it normal to feel days are somehow less productive, even if you've been online all day? Tasks do seem to suck up more time than you think. Yes, um, there, there are days and I kind of think, what did I do today? Maybe because I've been on conference calls nearly all day. Um, and and yeah, so you do feel like that. But actually, I look back and go, yeah, what did I achieve? You know, today we've achieved a lot around, you know, before this call today. Um, I've been on a ver variety of calls and sometimes you don't feel like the calls are actual work, um, but they are. You know, we've got uh, least three projects on the go where we're on development deliveries and I've been on conference calls and collaborating and sharing screen to walk through the things we're delivering and check whether they're working or not and feedback into the team whether I think changes need to be made. So sometimes it feels like you're not working, but actually you are. And 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 that feedback to the team is important. Okay. Um, how many people is too many people on a video call? Cool. Um, yeah. I I prefer them personally to stay as small and compact as possible. You know, video calls is really how many screens can you see? You know, there's there's maybe four or five. If you're trying to do 20, it's, you know, on video, it's just not, I don't think productive. Um, and I would actually say to everyone anyway, if there's that many people that need to be on this, be on audio only. Um, because you can't see all those people in that one hit and they're not going to be speaking all at the same time. So be on audio, be on mute. Okay, great. Um, Russell, how do you how do you keep staff morale up when more and more publishers around us are furloughing or laying off their staff? Um, I'm not sure that that one is a one um, I can answer it. I suppose in this context, you know, I'm talking to customers, um, and obviously they're going through this. They're my customers. Um, we're providing as much support as we can to them, but um ourselves we, you know we're still busy supporting them um so i'm not having that experience i think it's more something publishers themselves have, you know probably got to share between them and maybe doing something as a forum as an extension of this um might be a useful idea sorry i'm not probably not giving a very good answer to that question but uh, yeah i'm not sure i'm the best positioned on it OK, um, how do you get your editorial team and marketing team communicating and working better together? Um, wow. Um, as, uh, are we talking about in this environment then for, for um, I suppose? I, I, for... I think as in working remotely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you, in bigger organisations, um, some of the etiquette that we talk about within a team you've also got to talk about etiquette across teams um so yeah organizing focus meetings with those groups it is very easy with all of these tools to drift into um everyone feeling as if they've got to contribute into a call or a meeting um as i say the, the emphasis we always have is keep everything pretty tight and pretty focused so that time doesn't just drift on um and that when you you organize it you've you know more so than ever you know every, i'm sure everyone goes through these things about how to organize meetings anyway you know and make them effective but they apply more so um when you're trying to do it online and remotely um so yeah having a reasonably good agenda you know if it's an individual call or if it's a repetitive call having a, a process that you stick to this is how we do this call and and also having people that are kind of the controllers of the call you know sometimes it's me sometimes it's someone else in the team where we start to drift kind of going no you know we're drifting off the topic we're drifting off the purpose of this call that's for another call um fine take that as an outcome of this meeting that you need to go and do that but let's get back to the topic of this call so that it stays focused on delivering what it's supposed to all right great Russell I've got time for two more um first of all first of all I read somewhere that working in your pajamas was a bad idea um do you have any thoughts on that um yeah I mean I I'm not sure it's a bad idea I mean I think that's more about personal um 
you know, how people keep themselves motivated, how they separate, you know, work from personal life in, in the home when you're doing this. I do know from experience that um, having, you know, done this for five years, in the first few years, and, and my wife and kids will, will probably say this as well, it is very easy to get sucked into working continuously, you know. It gets to five o'clock. Oh, it's all of a sudden seven o'clock. I'm still doing this. If I was in my pajamas, I'd still be in my pajamas at seven o'clock in the evening. So I think what you're really saying is establish some routines and some separations so that you can manage your time, particularly now where you can't go anywhere else. So okay. I think, yeah, you know, it's probably good to change to make sure you feel like I'm at work kind of thing. OK, great. And, and finally, last one, Russell. Um, when this crisis is over, do you think publishers will be tempted to stick with remote working? Some will, definitely. I think some, um, you know, th this is a, a changing moment. I've always said in some ways that publishing, um, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, is a bit of a cottage industry. You know, if you look at how a lot of magazines start up, they actually started historically in people's front rooms and houses and grew into businesses as they became successful and then became part of bigger publishing organisations. We know that some of our customers already have quite significant chunks of their teams working from home, either full time or, or so many days a week and hot desk in in offices. I think this will lead to an extension of that. And I think it will make some of the other publishing organisations recognise recognize there are other ways to work. Um, yeah, you know, it won't be everyone, um, but I do think there will be a chunk of publishers that will, will not go back to what they were doing before. Excellent. Russell, well, thank you very much. Um, that, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. We've, we've overrun slightly, but there were, there were lots of um, excellent questions. So thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, a recording of today's webinar will be available soon, and we will email you a link to it sometime tomorrow afternoon. We will be publishing more information about forthcoming webinars shortly. Until next time, stay safe. Thank you for listening, and have a very good afternoon.